let's pick up on that point. I find that rather interesting. What's that? That you said that you're not accustomed to doing this kind of thing, that your partner was always the one to do the talking. Well, although Johnny was more articulate than I was, and he, uh, he had what we call the felicitous, the felicitous phrase. He just seemed to know how to say it. And I uh, bumble around occasionally, so I was happy as hell for him to do all that. But now I'm forced, I'm forced to do this by myself. But I do miss him. If he, if he were here, I'd be much happier. If he, if he were here right now in this studio, what would you say to him? I'd say, hello, John. Or I'd say no to him. <laughs> no? Yeah, you know, well, when we, when we wrote script, uh, you know, there are two partners, both very much not alike at all. We really were quite different in that uh, Johnny used broader strokes and I liked the uh, little more subtlety. So we would fight it out. And, and he once turned to me and he says, you know, you invented no. Because, you know, he'd say, let's do it this way. I'd say, no, automatically until we'd argue it out. But in the final analysis, we'd come up with something that we both liked. Yeah, it was kind of interesting when I was doing some research uh, on your background together. There was a quote in which you talked about it being, you were together for 56 years. It was a sort of marriage, but one without kids. <laughs> yes. Well, was some laughs, no children. <laughs> we, got a, we had some laughs. Was it a marriage made in heaven? I think it was just uh, very lucky. We met in high school at Harvard Collegiate, and uh, we were involved in this crazy little uh, group called the Ula Bula Club, which did sketches. And we had a wonderful teacher who taught us about Leacock and uh, read P.G. Wodehouse and you know all the. And so we got involved in comedy in those very early days. But, and but what is it? Was it a relationship that worked? The stories that I hear had Johnny being the authoritative, aggressive one, and we're going to do it this way. And you would say, okay, anything. Like that. <laughs> Not true. Not true at all. When we were in a group of people, I usually backed up because he uh, he was a man of some ego. And it would be very hard to him to, to accept losing. But when we were sitting in a corner, I'd say, look, John, let's do it this way. And he'd say, OK. Is that why it worked? Is that why you were able yeah, to Yeah, I knew. This but marriage? he would back off, too, you see. We would both back off. But I'd back off a little more than him. But in the final analysis, he would come over to me and say, Frank, why don't we try it this way? And I'd say, good idea, but it was my way. <laughs> you know, but that happened. Look, partnerships are made up of two different kinds. If we were both the same person, there wouldn't be a need for a partner. What do you miss most about him not being here today? Well, it's, uh, I, like, I like the arguments, frankly, because I come up with a premise. I go to him. Naturally, he's, he's going to try to shoot holes in it because he didn't think of it. Or when he comes to me with an idea, I say, damn him, why did he think of it and I didn't? And we'd argue it out. But out of this argument usually came the sketch the way it should be. So it, it, this, this constant uh, rapport, uh, working back and forth, this so-called conflict, was really, was really heaven. We loved it. You know, It was good. Let me take you through history a little bit. You worked together in high school. Then you did radio together. You no, made we the did university together. We did all the college shows. We did uh, the University College Follies. Uh, out of that, somebody came and saw our show from, uh, from McLaren's Advertising, and uh, he thought we weren't bad. And we heard about that. We bothered him for about a year. And we were still at the university, and he finally gave us a little morning show on CFRB. From there, you moved to CBC Radio, and Radio. Then you had your own program on, on television yeah. in Canada. And then Ed Sullivan spotted you. Why do you think Ed liked you? Well, uh, Ed liked us for, I, I didn't figure this out for about two years. You see, Ed had a lot of great stand-up comedians. There were very little sketch comedy on his show. He once had Burt Lahr and Nancy Walker do a sketch, but Alan King tried a sketch once, and Sid Caesar with Imogene Coca tried sketches, but they were only on a couple of times. Uh, we gave him something a little different. Uh, we would come on with a 16-minute sketch about the grandeur that was Rome, the assassination of Julius Caesar, with everybody in costume, scenic design, lighting, special effects, background music. This was a film. This was a, this was a movie, practically. You know, and this was on his stage. And he said, production values. 
I don't get that from the other comedians. Usually a fellow in the, in the 60s wearing a $300 in those days, an Italian silk suit saying, what's the matter with kids today? Or my wife is driving me crazy. And in one, standing in front of the curtain, and that was the comedy of his show. All of a sudden, we're giving him something else, you know, like a three-act play. I want to ask you that question again because I want you to give me that answer a bit shorter. <laughs> a bit shorter, if had, yeah. If you had to basically say he liked us because we were funnier than most comedians, we provided something that was different, how would you narrow that down a bit more? Well, he thought we were literate, believe it or not, which is strange because we certainly, you know, we've had high school, we've had university, but uh, we were not particular. We were a touch, we had a touch of literacy in us. But wait, let me try that again. Uh, he liked us because uh, he thought we were different. Most of the comedians stood up in one doing what's, uh, what's the matter with kids today, whereas we provided with this, this play of production values. We had costumes, scenic design, we had all those things, and that was, uh, and nobody had that on the Sullivan Show. He, he, thought you were, he liked you so much, in fact, he signed you to 67 performances, which I gather is quite a record. It is a record. For oh, no, we show. hold the record. Actually, there is a new book out uh, called A Really Big Show, and it, it lists the number of appearances, and it says 58, and we hold the record. However, it was 67 when you include repeats. Now, with all of this attention, that's really, I think, would it be fair to say when Canadians also discovered that you were a great talent, that the two of you were ours now that the American well, I, had discovered I, I, I used the line is, is we got to be so popular in America that Canadians started to watch us. <laughs> Which, but we were always a top rated show in Canada. Did, did, that, it, did you feel resentful in any way that you had to go to the States to make it big before you No, no, no. We didn't even want to go to the States. But uh, this thing came along, and we'd been having a little trouble with the CBC, actually, about the discussion of a new contract. And then uh, Ed Sullivan came along to say, well, this is a chance to do some work in the United States. You know, you have to go there to get the good housekeeping seal of approval. That's why most of our Canadians left. You know, Lauren Green, William Shatner, a whole gang of them left. None of them wanted to go to the United States, but uh, they needed a gig. And you? And Johnny chose to stay. You had offers to go to Los Angeles, oh, to yes. Hollywood, New York. Why did you choose to stay in Canada? You got to remember, the uh, Johnny and I did not like the gypsy life of show business. We actually were both born in Toronto, lived there all our lives, had our friends, our family, and uh, we were making a living. So the job you went to work, and then you came home to your family. Yeah, I mean the CBC. If you don't mind me mentioning a. And I, <laughs> what organization is that? I don't, CBC. <laughs> I, yeah, no. yes. Anyway, <laughs> we've worked there all our lives, and they were very nice to us. So we always were happy. But this moment with the Sullivan Show, uh, you could go to New York on Tuesday, cast it, get everything set up, do the show on Sunday, and Monday morning you're back in Toronto. I, I just want to mention the fact that this gypsy life is something that Johnny and I hated. And uh, we had many offers to go in and do uh, nightclub work, you know, do different things, and we always refused. We never did a weekly show on television. We never believed in it. We wanted to do specials. We used to do about four or five a year. We had time to write, to think. And so it really wasn't a question of making a lot of money. It was doing the things we enjoyed doing. And this was, this was great. Let me ask you to stand back for a minute, if you can, and assume the role of television critic. Okay. In the 90s, you take a look at Wade and Schuster. Would they be funny today? I think, uh, you know, we came from a kinder, gentler area. We were, uh, you know, we always use the uh, expression innocent merriment. Now, whether that would be as successful today, I'm not sure. And I, but if Johnny and I were working today, we would try to reflect today's tastes and values without going into the violence or the black comedy. We just couldn't, we were not that type. And I think there's still room for our type of comedy. Who, uh, who are your heroes, if I can use that uh, Well, word. you know, there are a lot of wonderful people. There are so many good stand-up comedians today, but I'm really, I am fond of sketch comedy. And Billy Crystal, you see, he's a comedy actor, and he bridges the, the generation gap. 
I mean, he would be a star in the 40s or the 90s. And uh, I like Lily Tomlin very much because she also is an actress. Robin, Robin Williams, if there's somebody going to be tagged as a genius, I guess you could call him that. But they are all comedy actors, and I think that's what I like. All right, let's go back to the 50s and 60s then, uh, the real heyday of, of, of the two of you on television. What made you funny? What made us funny? Haven't the vaguest idea. You know, people ask ask us what 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 was what's funny, and uh, we always said we said don't try to analyze analyze comedy. You know, don't don't uh, put it apart because you can never put it together again. It's a fragile thing, and we never all we knew that what we thought was funny, what made us laugh, was what we're going to present to the public. If they like it, we're in. If they don't like it, we're off the air. Some people are naturally funny. Were you naturally funny, or did you have to work at it? I was funnier than Johnny in school. I used to be kicked out of class all the time, yeah. throwing quiet little lines, you know. But and, but Johnny was a good little boy. <laughs> but he really was a much funnier, you know. He had a wilder sense of humor than I did. But is it the kind of humor where if I say "boy" to you, you come up with a one-liner, or do you have to go away and think about it for a while and then come back with a story? No, no, we usually sat, no, sometimes we were wonderful in a free-form ad-lib setup, and other times we'd sit down and say, let's think this out and write it down carefully, and then rewrite it, and then the day, the minute before you go on the air, you rewrite it again. In other words, it's never right. Comedy is, it's just an impossible thing to talk about. But let me try and push this a bit more, then, if we're okay. going to try and talk Carry about on. it a Do little bit. Do the best you can. Um, the two of you were very educated. You had university degrees. The type of humor dealt with the precision of the English language, the use of puns and cliches. Was that intentional, or was that just something you found so easy so you naturally went it for it? It was easy for us. You know, if a, if a pun was acceptable and it was good, you know, we thought it was a good pun, we would use it. And if a, a literate thing came up, and it, like our Shakespearean baseball game is one of the things we are very proud of. One line, I think, is classic where, uh, I don't know, this is going to take an hour, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> one, the, one line. One, one line, yeah. But the point is, while this baseball game is going on, there is a hit. And I say a hit, a very palpable hit, and the umpire cries, foul ball. Johnny goes to the umpire and says, that ball was fair. The umpire says, that ball was foul. And Johnny said, so fair a foul I have not seen. Now, you see, that's, that's good. And that's literate. And that came just while we're writing script. Is Frank Schuster funny without John Wayne? Oh, I, uh, I had my moments. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, in ordinary conversation, I can be the dullest person in the world. And every now and again, when the, when the ambience is right, I, I can fly like Robin Williams on occasion. Is there a Frank Schuster without a Johnny Wayne? Well, I'm working. You know, I'm, uh, the CBC have kindly made me a consultant. You know, when they don't know what the hell to do with you, they make you a consultant. But I'm working on various things, and uh, I never intend to go on and do a comedy turn on my own. I wouldn't do that, because it's too late for that. But I can sit and write and produce and put together things, and that's what I'm doing now. Reflecting on the past, do you think in, at all that there were difficult times, there were years where you struggled, that the two of you had to prove yourselves? I, uh, people used to say, what about the critics? And I don't know, we, uh, maybe people hid the critical uh, things that went on from us because we always thought we were doing great. I think we were uh, quite innocent. You know, we thought everything was going good. Every year, we, we never, from 1946, when we got our first Wayne and Schuster radio show, through to 1990, we were never without work. We, we, all we did was turn down things that we could do. Everything was great. So I, I don't remember any bad times. I'm going to ask you the classic Barbara Walters question. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, I don't know. We were... Uh, we were two guys who enjoyed working together, and uh, we liked, uh, you know, the old Rodney Dangerfield line. He said, it's nice to get one of these. It's got nothing to do with money. It's just to be when you do a show and somebody goes, he says, well, we've had a few of those. And 
like to be remembered that we, we brought a few laughs to the people and they liked us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Is it all right? I have no idea. I thought you were great. Oh, oh, lots well. of material. I'm thinking with a little. <laughs> Where did you get your material? We stole it. <laughs> no. It's, um... Why don't I ask you that? Are we still rolling? Did I not give you 10 seconds the last time? two seconds. It felt like 10. Yeah, you got to count it. <laughs> no, it's for the tape editors because okay. they need uh, time to figure out. Okay. Okay, I'm rolling. 10. Nine, eight, seven. Gee, it felt like ten the last time. Six. Okay. Um, I suppose I should come right out and simply ask it. Where did you get your material? Well, you know, when you start out and you you just look around, you you look for what's silly, yeah. what's nonsense, or things that irritate you. K-tail commercials, let's say, anything. Restaurant critics. Just you look around and you say, that's, you know, I hate that, and let's do something about that. And also, uh, over the years, you know, we were brought up on motion pictures. We loved film. Citizen Kane became Citizen Wayne. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing. So we, we take off books, radio shows, television shows, movies, and uh, we just looked around and... Uh, you basically stole material. What? <laughs> you stole material? <laughs> Actually, nothing was stolen. It was all borrowed. Uh, what makes Canadians laugh? Is it different than uh, what makes Americans laugh? Uh, it, it really isn't different at all. Because uh, there is a famous joke that we did in the Julius Caesar when Johnny walks into the bar, the Roman bar, and asks for a, a martinis. And the bartender says, you mean martini? And he says, if I want to, I'll ask for them, <laughs> right? Now, that's a Latin joke. Yeah. We did that in Canada. We did that on the Ed Sullivan Show, where the Americans don't uh, study Latin as much as we do. Yeah. We did that on the BBC. And the BBC questioned us, saying, well, you know, do you, do you think everybody will get it? And we said, don't worry about it. Now, this is in the land of Latin. Yeah. And they wondered about it. So it just shows you. I, we never changed anything. We do the sh sketch first in Canada. And we thought it was good. We'd take it to the Sullivan Show. We would do it exactly the same way. But do Canadians have a different sense of humor? I think they're cooler. I think they're a little tougher. I could talk about production meetings. You do a production meeting in the United States, and we've done shows in New York and Hollywood, and there are 20 people sitting there, and they're, they're staring at you. And uh, when you say, when you read the script, they're on the floor. It's wonderful, funny. You do the same thing in a Canadian production meeting, and they say, you're not going to do that, are you? They're not sure. Once in a while, they smile. They're a little more like, a little more American now, but when we started, it was very cool. And I think Canadians are, uh, are a cooler race than the Americans are. There's less hype. You get a more honest evaluation of what the, what the material is from our people. You really do. Thank you.